Our next speaker joining us is also returning presence to Textilvania. So he has been here before, and after his last trip, he was so impressed by the region that he even opened up an engineering team. At the end, we were not able to manage to capture him for Romania, but he opened up an engineering team in Moldova. But nevertheless, I think we've done like a great job to convince Silicon Valley entrepreneur to come to the region. So I think that's something that I'm very glad. And I'm super excited to welcome back Arik Grosch. So he's a co-founder and the CTO of Mixbook, a company that builds web-based experience to help people express themselves and tell their stories through personalized photo products. He was, among many other things, named as uh, one of the 30 under 30 list of the coolest entrepreneurs and he had like one of the fastest growing companies. Um, he had a very remarkable story on how he built his company and his team um, and he's going to talk to you how only the art survive and he will give you a great introduction on how to build and scale technology teams. Please welcome Arik. All right, well, thanks for having me here today. And, uh, oh, there's my presentation. Great, so today I'm gonna talk about some of the odd things we do as a startup. So I started my company, I'll tell you about myself. I'm the CTO and co-founder of Mixbook. And uh, here's a little about me, real quick. Uh, let's see, so. Um, I went to University of California, Berkeley. For anybody who knows where that is, it's in California, it's the first university. Um, I did my BS in industrial engineering, and I graduated from the CET, which is a center for entrepreneurship and technology. So my background's in engineering and business and entrepreneurship. So I'm also a self-taught programmer, but enough about me. Let's talk about real quick, what does my startup do, so you understand the context. So Mixbook is essentially a platform that allows users to create custom photo products on the internet. Um, we mainly specialize in photo books, but we do cards, calendars, canvas prints, and other kinds of products. The goal is to allow users to uh, express their stories, express their life experiences through printed photo products. So, Real quick, a little bit more about us, so you understand maybe the scale. We've, uh, we do tens, uh, tens of millions in revenue. We're the number three photo book provider in the US online, and we have um, close to a billion photos uploaded. So we deal with a lot of uh, data. So about my talk, uh, you might be wondering, okay, why is it important to do odd things in a startup? Don't you kind of just want to do what's normal? And I want to leave you with a quote here from Paul Graham. He says, if you do everything the way the average startup does it, you should expect average performance. The problem here is that average performance means that you'll go out of business. The survival rate of startups is way less than 50%. So if you're not running uh, a startup, if you are running a startup, you better be doing something odd. If not, you're in trouble. So, with that said, I'll talk about some of the things we do which are not the typical common things to do for a Silicon Valley startup company. So that's an odd uh, thing. <laughs> All right, so one thing is most uh, Silicon Valley companies who end up outsourcing are usually doing it to, cost, to save on costs. And while that is one of our motivations, um, we decided to heavily invest in our office. So most, it's typical for most uh, startup companies to underinvest in their offices, not give the most important uh, projects and whatnot, and treat it kind of like a second uh, class piece of their puzzle. Uh, so for us, we've uh, actually developed a, an office um, in Eastern Europe and we decided to invest heavily in it to create the same kind of environment, the same kind of culture that we have uh, in Silicon Valley. So once a year, we take the entire team uh, from Eastern Europe, we fly them out to San Francisco to uh, join us 
and work together face to face. And by doing this, um, we've been able to kind of reduce the um, impersonal nature of working remotely. We also tend to give everybody uh, in our product organization a budget so they can spend on anything they want. So if they want a shiny new equipment or if they want uh, to go to a conference, they can decide what they want to do. And by giving a budget, we don't have to, have to, we don't have to deal with a complicated approval process. You know, can I go to this? Can I go to that? Uh, they can buy, you know, the newest laptop every season if they want to, or they can go to cool conferences like developer conferences or Techsylvania. We also treat contractors the same way. So typically, you have contractors, you kind of pay them, they do their work, and you pay them for that work, and that's it. But for us, it's really important for the team cohesion to be there. So we also invite them to the holiday party. We also bring them on site, fly them to work face to face with the rest of our team members, and treat them pretty much the same. They have access to all of our code, even the things they aren't working on. And they have access to um, all the news about the company, all the company updates, and whatnot. So one thing that's pretty typical for most startups to do is to measure based on, um, on deliverables. So you ship a project, you ship a widget, you ship that, and you kind of get rewarded based on that. And so for us, we are almost fully based on revenue impact to the business. So everything that teams do must ultimately translate back into revenue or profit or some metric uh, that is not just, we got the work done, and that's it. This also carries over to bugs. So you might think, oh, that's a really nasty bug on our site because you know, that page is flickering or whatever, and then you go and you attack that. Uh, but again, we've translated everything into an outage impact. So if, for example, um, it's on a page of our site that it's not that important, even though it seems really severe, but the revenue impact is not high, we'll actually prioritize it lower. So we don't do the traditional kind of critical major um, moderate bug sort of thing. Uh, we also don't measure our DevOps and systems based on like how many nines uh, do we have. Like what's, how many nines do you have per year? Is it two nines, three nines? And what that basically means is this, what percentage of the year is your site up. And so for us, uh, especially being a seasonal business, if we're down for one hour on Cyber Monday, that could be like four days of revenue in like February. So it's much more important for our site to be up, and therefore we measure the impact of outages based on the revenue lost. So when we um, say if our team is doing well, they might have like five hours of downtime throughout the year, well, that's a lot, but they weren't down at all in Q4, and that's where we make half our revenue. And so it'll be a lot better. So we also don't trust ourselves <laughs> at all with the things that we do, and we explicitly A-B test everything that we release. And this is, you know, something for another topic, but A-B testing can be pretty tricky if you don't have a billion page hits a day but we still push for A-B testing everything to understand uh, the difference uh, between, you know, even if we release a faster platform, like let's say we switch to React, like a full uh, single page web app, and we expect it to be faster than a server, uh, load, server uh, um, rendering. We still will test it, and interestingly enough, we usually find that there are issues even with the faster version so that you don't necessarily anticipate when you're first doing it. We also, as well, when we deploy anything to the, uh, we deploy several times a week, we email out the whole company, including everybody in marketing, including admins, including finance, uh, to let them know about all the changes that go out constantly. And this provides a really great way for uh, the entire team to understand what might impact their jobs. So in marketing, if you have a promotion that's going out and they just recently changed the checkout, well, you should probably be aware that the, the optimization and checkout could potentially affect your promotion if it involves free shipping. And let's say the shipping uh, selectors were changed, maybe you want to know that 
uh, ahead of time. So if something happens to your promotion, you'll know maybe what happened. And we also do the same thing with bugs and downtime. So whenever there's a live issue and customers are impacted, an email goes out to the entire company that alerts everybody that issue, because again, it can impact marketing, it impacts customer support, it impacts finance, all the pieces of the organization. Another thing we do that's a little bit odd is we share all of our code with everybody in the company, uh, every repository. And for a lot of companies at scale, you know, if you're a startup of a few people, it's, it's pretty typical to have access to everything. But when you're at scale, you tend to not share uh, everything across all departments. And uh, as uh, in our organization, we do that, and it allows us to, um, to be better aware of like code smells or different approaches to engineering and things that could end up becoming more uh, tech debt as we scale. So we don't just do it with code, we do it with everything. So even board decks uh, <clears throat> that are somewhat private, we send those out to the entire company. We're very open, transparent about our growth and about our direction as a business. Um, marketing materials are shared with engineers. If they want to see the branding deck, they can see the branding deck. If they want to see all the things that led up to that branding decision, they can see that. Um, even though it's not necessarily completely obvious how that affects their feature that they're currently working on. So, we also hire only full stack developers and train all developers who are not full stack to be full stack. And one of the reasons for this is that as a startup that's in a mid stage, it's really important for us to be nimble and change based on what the market demands are. Um, when we first started the business, the iPhone wasn't even launched yet. And since then, we've done iPhone apps, we've you know, done three iterations of our website, we've changed technology stacks. So for us, we don't really care what technologies a developer knows coming in. Obviously, if they know our technologies, which is uh, Ruby on Rails and React, then that's a lot better. But for us, it's really more about the problem solving and how they work on the team with everybody else. So by having full stack engineers, that allows us to do some interesting things. When we have to choose teams, we are able to try um, this thing that uh, me and the, our VP of engineering came up with, which is called the developer draft. And if you guys watch any professional sports, at the beginning of the season, you have coaches, you have players. Players like kind of want to play for a certain team, and coaches want to get certain players. So there's this natural kind of market that happens. So when it's time for us to pick teams, since everybody's kind of trained in everything, and we want to just um, fund teams at a certain amount, so let's say we want the site team to be four people, we want the uh, DevOps team to be three people, we can kind of allocate a budget to each of those product owners, and they can kind of then pick their teams. And so here's like some rules we came up with. And um, the, the idea is for the POs to try to sell their vision to those teammates so that those teammates can give some points towards those POs, AKA coaches, to get onto their teams. So when you do the draft, um, it looks something like this. And uh, we tried this. On the left side, we don't have the names, but on the far left would be the columns of the developers. And developers are all full stack. And the teams, we have three teams. In this case, you can see Patrick and um, Jim and uh, Steve and Simon. So we have four POs. And each of them are basically bidding points on each player, AKA developer. And some of them have certain advantages because um, the developers gave points to be on that team. So they become cheaper in a way for that coach. Because like, I really want to pay for, play for Los Angeles. You know, like I'll take a pay cut or something like that. Although it's not a real pay cut, it's actually a point cut. And so when you end up doing it, we, we did this and uh, this was kind of something that I haven't seen anybody else quite do it this way. And it came, we came with some interesting, um, we end up with some interesting results from it. But in order for this to work well, you have to have every developer understand what the POs are working on, and the POs have to understand 
all the skill sets of the developers very well. Because if they don't, they might not craft the right team, might not have the right chemistry, and things might end up falling apart. So there are downsides to this. Most companies will use kind of a benevolent dictator, AKA there's a VP of engineering, he sits down, he tries to make everybody happy, he tries to allocate the teams, and then he makes changes after that. We were saying, is there a way we can completely be out of it and just push it down to the teams and the, and the product owners to figure out themselves? So this is an interesting thing we tried. Uh, we don't actually uh, do it today, but uh, it was an interesting experience. We did it for like two years. So another thing that we do is we really promote the idea of career changes. So if you come in and you're a, um, a site developer and you want to work in DevOps, we will actually assist with that and train you and do that. So quick example. Uh, Robert Green, he's a DevOps developer at Mixbook. He came in, he knew nothing about DevOps. He was an iOS developer working on our I, uh, iOS app at the time. But he really wanted to like, do DevOps. He really wanted to like, auto-scale things, create new servers, get in the cloud, like, move tons of data around. But he didn't know how. So we taught him uh, Ruby on Rails when he came on. And we assisted in him learning Chef, and as well as Amazon Web Services. And eventually, he's now leading by himself our entire back-end infrastructure. And here was a picture of him um, running a data center migration when we moved from a kind of like hosted solution to completely cloud. So this was a, like a few years ago. But you can see he has like all the screens up, and he's just like doing his thing. It was awesome to see. So last but not least, something we don't do that's typical at a company at our stage is we don't have a QA team. And a lot of times we have a product uh, managers that come in, and they say, where's my QA person? And it's like, well, we don't do QA. Would you rather have another developer? Or would you rather have QA? And almost always, uh, POs will choose another developer. And so by doing that, we've had to really focus on heavily on testing and uh, best practices um, in our uh, code base and code stack. Because when you're taking the full responsibility of what you deploy, and you don't have QA to kind of do that, either the, P, the product owner has to do more QA, or the developers have to spend more time on that. And so there is obviously more of an uh, impact to the team, but it also pushes for more responsibility, better quality code, and more scalable code at the same time. So with that, that's my quick talk. That's all, folks. And if anybody has any questions or wants to follow me on Instagram, there's the info for that. And I think uh, Philip's going to come on stage. Yes. To, uh, so we have, since, since you the, uh, have like still one, two minutes left, we said we yeah. can take one question from the audience. We have a microphone here. So if anybody has one question for the audience, we'll have that before time for this talk is up. So do we have any quick question for Arik? Otherwise, I'll, I'll, I'll ask one if nobody has. OK, then you have to, then you have to answer my question. Everybody's still st shy in the morning. Wait, there's so one. Okay. I think I saw somebody. OK, go ahead. <laughs> do we have one? Sorry, I didn't like. I thought I saw somebody. This guy's fine. Somebody they, put was just, like, they put their hand down. Mo moving around to get another, the, the first coffee. Sure. So, my, my question is, like, when, when you hire these people, when does it not work out, right? You shared your success story. Mm -hmm. Can you share when you get somebody on board and, like, it totally didn't work to adopt that person to your methodology? Because a lot of it is fairly unique. Yeah. So can you share when it didn't work out? Yeah, well, I, I would say that, you know, a lot of times people join our organization because our conditions are great. You know, we have a great team, a lot of smart people. And sometimes they come in with... Um, they come from other organizations which are a lot more structured and where it's a lot more uh, specialized. And I think that's where a lot of issues come is if you can't say, hey, I know I'm a senior developer, but I've only been senior in Java, and now I'm being hired to do you know, Ruby, and like, I know nothing about Ruby. And if they can't uh, overcome that feeling of, like, I can't contribute as much, um, that's where we tend to get issues. Another place where... Um, it can be tricky for people uh, who come on board 
is, um, is kind of being full stack. Um, people like to either work in back end and front end. And people who like doing back end hate fixing CSS bugs. People who do CSS stuff like, and front end stuff and, and bootstrap are not keen on doing algorithms in the back end. And so that's a place where we push people really hard to kind of get that full stack. And uh, we get some tension on, on that side as well. OK. Thank you very much, Eric. Highly yeah. appreciate it. Thank you.